Care Collab. Thank you so very, very much for joining me. Bit of a breezy day. I'm going to try and protect the mic. Thank you for being here. Really appreciate your time and your interest. Together with Gabriella Carson today, we're going to be focusing on Ascocentrum ampuyatheum. Mine happens to be named as Pink Dreamer, which is very fitting. As you can see, I have mine in bloom. Finally, after missing out on the blooms in 2020. So the interesting thing about missing out on the blooms in 2020, whereas I had her bloom in 2029, was her light levels. So let's jump right in and discuss light with regards to this Ampoyathea. I'm gonna be showing some locations as I talk through this. In 2019, I had my Ampoyathea in a basket with just lava rock, similar to what my Neostylus Blue is at the moment. They like to have a humidity of 80 to 85% during the summertime, their growing season. I have humidity of 30% during summertime. Definitely not happy environment for this one during its growing season. Today, it is now April and I happen to have 63%, which is exactly the opposite of what they like regarding humidity. In winter, they prefer to have 63%. Turns out I have around 80 to 85 in the winter. Given those two factors are learned very, very quickly in 2019 that I wasn't gonna be able to keep up with keeping her hydrated, watered enough to give her the humidity she needs because of this. This is what I do to keep those aerial roots happy. And you can see that they are not at this point extending and they should be. So what I did then in 2020 was pot her up into Lekka with self-watering. The roots are not very, very easy to manipulate. They are very stiff. They prefer to be aerial and they don't normally become happy campers once they're covered up, as you can see here, with my attempt to keep the humidity around a root covered by a microfiber, and the root promptly deteriorated. And even though I just partially covered it. So the microfiber works for humidity, but it doesn't, the roots don't like it. However, I have one root that I managed to get into the pot and it is not deteriorating. It is happy in there. I am not going to pull, do my tug test. I am just really, really relieved that I happen to have one root in the pot and that's how she will stay. So imagine how difficult it is for me to keep her hydrated in my climate at 30% humidity in a basket of lava rocks. In 2020, when she did the change into this setup, I kept misting her and I kept her much, much darker regarding light levels, darker in Spain in the summer. It's not necessarily dark, but for this orchid, far too dark because her leaves went green. She used to always, always be this brown anthocyanin in color. In her case, it looks brown. It looks like the leaf is dying back, but it's not. So this was the color that she had in 2019 throughout the whole orchid, and she bloomed. When I protected her a little bit to make the transition less stressful in 2020, she turned this green and she didn't bloom. So the light levels requirement of this orchid are extremely high which is a problem in my climate, again, because of my low, low humidity. However, now that I have a root in the pot that is not failing, I can be a little less liberal with regards to spraying her. It was important for me to make one root successful because in the winter, I can't be doing what I'm doing now. She doesn't like to go below 13 degrees Celsius. That's okay. I can bring her inside where she lives under the LED lights where you can see my paths are right now. That is where she lives in the winter during the nights. But I still need to water her. So that was my biggest problem with regards to the care of my orchid after she bloomed in 2019. After she grew a bit more, her demands got a little bit more extensive and I couldn't provide for that. Humidity was an issue, the biggest issue. 
Light, not so much, because I can throw a lot of light at her here in southern Spain. It's just I can't do this spraying in winter. Those temperatures are too cold. There is not enough airflow to dry her off. Easy for rot to set in. This setup with the LECA and self-watering is now working a treat. I did miss out on the blooms last year, but she picked up a beautiful amount of growth last year. They're not fast growers, but the health of the leaves that subsequently came out during 2020, I was really happy with that. So now to get her to bloom again, the day temperatures in my winters are around 15 to 19 degrees, and more often than not, we have a lot of sun. So she was then always taken outside, put on the west facing rack while it was still there, which is now on my east side. But she was in full sun for the duration of the days before I brought her in in the evenings if my temperatures were to drop below 13 degrees Celsius. So pretty much up until December, this orchid can live outside anything below 13 degrees and I brought her in. But the amount of light that I was hitting her with during the January, February, March months were substantial and she became a deep, deep red. No need of concern, but basically there was no difference between the underside of the leaves, that color, and the upper side. You can still see some residue from prior months, but now that I've had her in spike, I've put her in my blooming alley where she is in shade based on the angle of the sun and look how green her leaves are going again. And that was the color of the leaves I had last year when she didn't bloom. When they all turned this anthocyanine red top and bottom, she bloomed. So light levels are very, very important for this one. She grows between 100 and 1000 meters all the way from the Himalayas to China, all the countries in between. And usually she's in a very, very high airflow environment. But again, the humidity is really high as well. So I have a lot of airflow. I don't have a lot of humidity. The humidity that she wants, I have in the winter. And what I have in the summer, she doesn't like at all. So self-watering with Lekka, one root, that is, for me, gold. Now. I can go a little bit more Rambo with regards to my sprayer this time of year. I've got enough warm air and windy air to take care of her. I need to do this like two or three times a day even. And then when we get into July, August, another dose probably just before sunset. I will always revert back to the humidity. I want to make very clear that the way I care for this orchid is based on my climate. It may not be conducive to cooler climates or indoor growing, but if you don't provide the humidity around her, all the roots will fail. As you can see in my case, they just stop. I am hoping for extensions. Let's have a look, see at this root tip. They are not dead roots, but if I don't have any humidity going for them, what she will do is produce more roots along the stem, but they will fail after they get to a certain length, like that. The root you see here, and here, and the back ones, these two were facing to the front, where now my citrina is standing. That was her location in 2020. So they were facing to the front, where the warm wind would pass across this way, and they didn't develop very long. The roots in the back here, we're facing the wall where it was a little bit more cooler and if I sprayed the back wall, there was more humidity. They got to this length. So I keep harping on about that because again, if I am in southern Spain and I have a humidity of 30% and I can go all Rambo with my sprayer three to four times a day, I am very, very cautious about saying that is what you have to do. But if how you grow yours, or if you intend to buy one and get one and grow it, the biggest factor here is humidity. It is one lucky stroke that I got a root to accept the lecker, and that I managed to get it in there without breaking the root. And you can see she's a little bit off center of the pot for a reason being, it was more important that this root goes into the lecker healthy without breaking it, as opposed to being OCD and putting her into the center of the pot. 
She blooms regularly, I would say, except for, you know, the transition into Lekka in 2020, but in 2019, around spring, she's in bloom. Always gives me two spikes. She is not fragrant, so I don't understand why I get little itty bitty aphids on her. It is such a pain to get these aphids off the blooms because they are tiny, tiny, clearly, and they are super delicate and, you know, it's just hard to manipulate them. I've, I've taken some pictures of close-ups just in case this zoom now doesn't work or doesn't do it justice. But I took some pictures because these blooms, small as they may be, they are just adorable. And maybe in the back here, you can see that it has a little tail at the end of it. So the front looks like, you know, just nothing, nothing special, I would say. They're too small to be appreciated with the naked eye. And then you look around the back and there's a lot more going on behind the bloom. I lost a couple of buds because I was treating for aphids. And that's another thing, paintbrush and alcohol, and I lost a few buds. Super, super delicate little blooms. Here you can see the gap. And there you can see another aphid. And it's like they, they are teeny, teeny, tiny, but they really, really bother me. I hate them, absolutely hate them, even though there's no fragrance. Astounding. There must be something else going on in the bloom that makes them come and... It's not like they're going to take them down, I don't think, but I wouldn't know because I just don't want them around, so I'm constantly trying to get them. I use either my paintbrush or my fingernail just to peel them off without breaking the bloom off the stem. But sometimes it's, you know, it just takes a little bit of care. I don't understand, but that's the pest that I have. And if sometimes in the apex, I've seen some mealybugs, those are easily dealt with. But I have no issues with scale or anything like that, thank goodness, because I don't want to get into the stem of the orchid too much the amount of times I have to spray her. I don't want you to use insecticidal soap on this one especially because of the aerial roots. If I get that soap or the oil substance of the rapeseed onto these roots, then they start to repel the water as well. I don't want any oily thing going on here. So it's a little bit of a dance with this one, but now that I have her established in self-watering, I'm a little bit more confident with letting her be, especially in winter when all I have to do is just mist around the base, never getting close to the orchid herself, just around the base here of the pot. And then occasional flushes, not much because most of the action is happening above the surface. There is a little bit of um, fertilized water in the reservoir at the bottom. I do make sure that there's always water because, because again, I'm trying to get the humidity as high as possible around this orchid. So if you are considering this orchid, let me tell you, she is not a space hogger. You can also find her under Banda Ampuyathea, but she is definitely, definitely one that would need to be supplemented with a humidifier if you can't go all gung-ho with a sprayer like I do. And in the past minutes that we have been here, you can see how quickly the roots dry off. Just because it's a breezy day, and then they dry off. So in my case, two or three times a day, that's not even an exaggeration. And then keeping this microfiber very, very damp. Even though I've lost part of this root down here, I keep this microfiber damp because I need to create that environment. I am just so happy to have one root. That's all I need. If I can get one root to survive and thrive, I'm almost certain that this orchid is not going to have any more issues with developing properly. I've had a few leaves drop at the bottom, and if that is the case, if you own this orchid or you get one in and you see leaves dropping at the bottom, that's normal. As the orchid ages, those leaves will go. And eventually, hopefully, I will get a little side plantlet coming out of the side. But yeah my little Ampuyathea pink dreamer. Hot pink blooms, I love them. They will last me now for about oh, another six, six weeks, definitely six weeks. I still have some buds to go. 
And this was filmed the day before publishing the video. So that's just to give you an idea that she has already opened some blooms prior. But as the day is right now, this is the 9th of April. So I'm expecting another six weeks out of her. Cute little thing, highly recommended. If you have ambient humidity of 80 to 85%, this one is not a problem whatsoever. Now that I have her established with one root in self-watering, she is not a problem whatsoever. Thank you very, very much, Gabriella Carson, for joining me on this Care Collab. I hope that these videos will be useful to anyone who's looking to grow an Ampoyathea or buy an Ampoyathea, or if you're having trouble with an Ampoyathea. Either way, if there's anything that I did not cover, then please let me know in the comments below and I'll be very happy to elaborate further. Have yourselves a wonderful day. I appreciate your time. Take care and please stay safe. Bye.